And I think in terms of innovating for the mining industry, you hear this word that mining is an innovative industry. And I think that this is an opportunity that um, is absolutely waiting to be picked up on. We know so much more now about the relevance and the importance, and now we have the tools. And just to sort of follow up on something that Elizabeth has mentioned, so the human genome um, took about 10 years to figure that out, and it was about 20,000 genes. We can do that same amount of characterization in about a month to a few weeks now. And the cost has come down over a million fold. So the techniques and the approaches are far more rapid and they're far more accessible. So the first thing that I would say is someone who works most of the time in steel toe boots or rubber boots in the field, we have complexity, we have to be able to characterize that. The tools are finally at a point where we can apply them very readily. So what I wanted to sort of do today was not give you detailed sort of pictures of what we're doing research-wise, though it's all very interesting and very cool, was to try and give you a sense of where might be some of these opportunities to think about innovating, where are the knowledge gaps, where can we inform using metagenomics. And if we think about a mineral resources development cycle from exploration through to operation reclamation, um, typically where we think about bacteria playing roles has been in the operation. So we think about water management. Mines, as most of you guys know, are not just extraction businesses. They're waste management systems. And water is a huge piece of this. And so water, also you can think about bioleaching, the side that can make you money, but also reclamation and monitoring. And so biology has, has kind of crept into these areas. And we're seeing some really enormous um, successes by using metagenomics there, I think. It's starting to come through. Less well appreciated, though I'm starting to hear questions, I sit on a number of exploration panels, is this idea about biogeochemical signals for ore deposits. So one of the first things to sort of wrap your head around, if you're not convinced yet, is that any mine is a bioreactor. Anywhere you go in the world, doesn't matter whether you take some dirt, whether you take a water sample, whether I go directly to the tailings line and take a sample of that, it will be full of bacteria. And very similar to some of the fluorescent images that um, Elizabeth was just showing, this is a pure tight tailings particle. And you can see what we've done is we've essentially interrogated that particle looking for bacteria. And so we add fluorescent probes. If there's DNA for bacteria, it lights up blue. We can then use specific probes looking for certain kinds of organisms. And of course, this one is actually a Cytothiobacillus for oxidants, the poster child of acid mine drainage. So any tailings particle will likely light up like this, full of bacteria. However, if we go into the mill, we can also see, we can take any concentrator sample, and again, here we've got that same daffy stain. It lights up like the Milky Way. Where are we at in terms of characterizing bacteria in our mine water systems? Well, if you think about the Milky Way, say you've identified six stars, the likelihood that you've got the brightest star is pretty minimal. We're pretty much at that state in terms of characterizing the endemic bugs that are already in your system, i.e. the bugs that are adapted and living there. We know very little about them. So the techniques are here, very low hanging fruit for us to start looking at them. If they're there, it's more than likely that they're adapted to those conditions and they're likely doing something. It could increase efficiencies, it could decrease efficiencies. But at the moment, that's a bit of a black box. But it's a knowledge gap that we can fill. So I love this picture too. Most of us, as you can sort of see, Elizabeth and I, are, we're not microbiologists by training. I've never taken a microbiology course, I'll admit it right now. But we absolutely recognize in geochemistry that we must, if we want to take a systems approach, i.e. we want to understand process, we've got to look at the relevant players. If we think about the origins of the planet, and again, this idea that life you know, began sort of 20 hours ago, we've only been on the planet for 17 seconds, right? Nano nats us in terms of geologic time. What's really important about that early life is that life's origins are rooted in anaerobic metabolisms of sulfur and iron. Sulfur and iron are core to any mining enterprise. So if we start thinking about moving beyond just that early life, and as a geochemist, we're thinking about planetary function. So we know, and exactly as Elizabeth had pointed out, that many organisms, in fact, most microbes, are not using oxygen. They're using something else. They're breathing something else. And beyond sulfur and iron, manganese, nitrogen, all the major planetary cycles are catalyzed by microbial activity. And these invisible geoengineers are basically driving our planet. And so as a geochemist, I'm thinking about this, and if we want to understand iron oxidation or sulfur oxidation, I know that those, those bugs are working in tandem with other bugs that are cycling carbon and often nitrogen. So we need a larger picture here. 
The second piece I want to sort of point out again, geologists, we like our, we like our um, origins of life and of the planet maps, but thinking about the Archean and sort of somewhere in here we have rise of microorganisms, some of our earliest fossils that suggest life sort of are around this time. But if you think about ore deposit formation, think about black smokers, those are exactly identical to thinking about the origins of life. So if you're starting to think about what are signals of ore deposits, what might be transformations of those, they are intimately associated with these organisms that are adapted and have evolved with those ore deposits. They've been around a very long time and they're very smart. So all we would do in this picture, which is just a very classic, and you see this all the time in ore deposit formation, they're almost always sterile, there's no life anywhere on that, <coughs> but we know that, and you know this for the most part, is that you're going to have alteration and diagenetic um, changes in this, and a lot of those are catalyzed by microbial processes. So, if we think about exploration, and I've been asked to think about this a lot more frequently um, lately, we typically get called in here as an aqueous geochemist and someone who's trying to figure out what bacteria do, I'm often called in when there starts to be an issue or there's some indicators that something might be going wrong to try and figure out if we can do something to prevent that. But I'm now being asked to think about exploration and I think a lot of you also in the room would know why. Um, you know, what makes a successful mine project is that you need to have discoverable, which is increasingly challenging. It needs to be developable and mineable, also increasingly challenging. So innovation is all about if you've got a challenge, how do you think outside the box? How do you do something differently that might improve your success? And I think that sort of bacteria are such an obvious low-hanging fruit in this regard. And so, you know, this is also you see various iterations of, of this figure, just sort of showing the cost of exploration, that high-grade deposits are increasingly hard to find, they're usually deeper, so there's a more cost, uh, a higher cost associated with developing them. So there, there's, there's risk here, and there's a lot of cost here that needs to be dealt with. If you look at as a geochemist, um, you know, ore deposits are simply mineral deposits that happen to have enough elements in them that you can extract to make money, right? That's all it is. It's the concentration of element that you're looking for. The formation processes, the diagenetic processes, are much broader in terms of understanding. We have a lot more understanding of these basic principles in geoscience. And so we can apply microbial biogeochemical understanding to these to think about are there ways, are there signals, are there processes that we could link to some of these buried deposits that would translate up into biogeochemical surface signals. This isn't, um, there's no need for you guys to reinvent the wheel. We're doing this already in the broader geoscience community. And you see this sort of um, percolating up in various pieces. I don't think they're necessarily as well linked as they can be. But this idea that you can take sort of geology and geochemistry, we can now combine it with microbiology. And, and I must confess that, you know, as, as a non-microbiologist, the idea that we're going to try to grow bugs is on plates of media makes no sense at all. But we don't do that anymore. And we can start thinking about how all of this intersects that might give us a better strategy, a way to sort of look at things. And I think that there's a low risk here in trying to look at some of this kind of science. And indeed, if you look at articles in The Economist or The Miner, they're all looking at these new ideas. How can we take new science and inform mining practice to be more sustainable and more efficient? And if you were to think about sort of a soil um, zone, and you know, there will be no pop quiz on this, but the only reason I sort of wanted to put it up is this is what you would see in a soil science or even in a geoscience course, is that we understand the physical, chemical, and biological processes at some scale that are going to interact to essentially show you what would happen in any system over time. And the key thing is that you'll see words like microbial, right? We don't see this in ore deposit models yet. But there's no reason why we can't take some of these ideas and translate them over. And the reason that you might want to do that is thinking about, essentially, we're starting to develop and apply these tools. We're showing great success with them. So we think about the evolution of these iron sulfur rich um, contexts. We know that life is very intimately associated with them. We can look at the rocks in the geochemistry. These are very typical signals. We're looking at metals. We're looking at minerals. We're looking at secondary diagenetic processes. 
but we can also start looking at the genes that are present, the potential um, possibility for alteration. As a metal geochemist and someone who looks at what microbes do in that world of, of minerals and metals, we know that they often alter the kinds of minerals that you form. They can do it under differing conditions. So you can have translation up, for instance, of differing minerals if certain organisms are there. So there's a lot of information we can translate over pretty quickly. If we go to sort of the, the side, I think, that, that has received more attention, and I think oftentimes this is because this is the side of the ledger that costs company money, so you need to be super efficient. Um, and I've found typically that the people working on the environment side are very, very smart and very, very interested in looking for the frontiers of science that could help advance how they do things. And so there's been a lot more interest and I think a lot more effort placed on this side of the equation. But we still have very, very many large unanswered questions. The identities, and particularly the roles, are not well constrained yet. And this, I think, is an enormous opportunity. Any geochemical process is more than likely to have microbes present. We can identify, are they important? Are they doing something useful? Are they doing something detrimental? And we can identify what are the controls on that. So this is an enormous space that needs to be filled in. And I think, you know, this is the, Again, this is when anybody sort of outside of a mining company talks about mining, one of the first things they'll bring up is acid mine drainage. The number one priority pollution issue for the mining industry on a global scale, and it is critical that mining companies start to de-risk this because we know that we're in a water shortage, water wars are starting to happen, the, the sort of the scrutiny over mining companies and what they're doing with water, how much they're using and the quality of that water that they return is becoming more and more uh, important. And so if we want to understand, and again, just to Elizabeth's point, so one of the things as a geochemist that's very useful and I think makes it tractable is that it doesn't matter what system we look at, the color of the water is very similar. We know it's very similar uh, processes that are occurring. So you might see differences in the kinds of bugs or the rates depending on where you are geographically, but fundamentally it's the same processes. So as we start to pull this together and start developing sort of a, a mining microbiome observatory, start looking at these organisms across different mines and looking at how they're essentially pushing those reactions, we can start to develop reactions that will have general uh, utility, but we can also start to look for boutique or um, exotic organisms that would have um, specific needs or specific opportunities. And in particular, I draw your attention to um, Iron Mountain, which many of you in the room may have heard about, pH values of minus two, battery acid. Organisms very happily living in this. So our concept of what's inhospitable makes no sense in the microbial world. It's exactly as Elizabeth said, if there's energy, they will be there. It's remarkable. I think this, you look at them, they're just a ball of lipids, right? Ball of fats. It's amazing where we can find them. But their capabilities to essentially find energy and to survive in these environments, they have no problems at all. And it goes back to the evolution of life and their start in the Archean. So that process of AMD, right, is basically waste residue, bacteria and water, there's some oxygen, the idea is that you essentially start catalyzing those oxidation reactions which generate acid, leach out metals. And this is the poster child, right? Acidothiobacillus peroxidans is the organism that is held up essentially like the E. coli of the health world, right? This is the bug that's held up and is often used in bioleaching. So the environmental side and sort of the processing side are essentially this two sides of the same coin. If we understand these organisms and characterize and go after new discoveries, in the environment of a mine site, we can actually find probably higher performance organisms, organisms that are capable of doing things at different uh, temperatures or pHs that we can bring back to the process side. So there's lots of opportunities there to inform. And again, you know, if you go to Wikipedia, it doesn't really matter. I tell this in my second year environmental geochemistry course, just go look online and see what you can find out about acid mine drainage and you will always see this summary reaction. Right? which is essentially an abiotic reaction, a straightforward linear oxidation of pyrite, gets you sulfate, acid, and you can essentially balance what your acid generation is going to be based on your, uh, sometimes mines only look at pH, sometimes they only look at sulfate, but the idea is that those two are going to be related. And as that process goes on, you're getting this, you have the potential for non-compliant wastewater. Um, and that's not something, I think most of you people in the room know that. But of course, 
Most mines have a water system that is not net acid generating. The issue is trying to identify when does it become net acid generating. And one of the reasons that there is a problem here in not being able to model that properly is that sulfur, so we have sulfide in H2S, sulfate, there is an eight electron transfer there. So electrons are the currency <coughs> of life, right? It's how you essentially get energy to do things. So an abiotic reaction is going to be driven by oxygen or iron. You'll go from sulfide to sulfate very quickly. No problem. If microbes are involved, they do things one or two electrons at a time. So they spend a lot of time playing in this space here. So these are what we would call sulfur oxidation intermediates between the two end members. Often in industry, that's what's called thiosalt, right? This is the thiosalt box. And this is still a black box in the industry. So, and the reason for that is that, so whenever there's multiple redox states, it allows for multiple pathways for bacteria to do things, right? And so we have to start teasing out what are the reaction arrays that are being catalyzed, which are the bugs that do that, what drives it. But we can get there. So this black box is really something that still remains undiscovered. And we were fortunate enough a few years ago to do some work up at, um, what is now Glencore and was at the time still Falconbridge, um, sort of characterizing what was going on in their tailings pond, now called an oxidation reservoir. And so one of the things that um, is, is interesting when you work with mining to sort of see the, the, the jargon change, um, but one of the things that we started to see, we, we did a study just looking at were there, was there evidence in situ of microbial thiosalt cycling? And we were able to show that they were the highest published rates of sulfur oxidation in the industry, but they were the only published rates. No, there were very few studies that had actually looked in situ at what were the oxidation rates of sulfur. It was also all particle associated. They were living on those tailings particles and catalyzing the sulfur reactions. But one of the things that I was sort of speaking at a, a conference, I think last summer, and was talking to Joe Fife, who's the superintendent for environment now up at Glencore, and has been there since it was Falconbridge. He invited us to come back and to, to sort of revisit some of these questions, because now we have these much better bacterial tools to start investigating this. And this is the, the, the playground where we need to be. This is your acid generating side, AMD, everybody knows that. If we want to give proactive approaches to mining, we need to start looking at what happens before you have an issue. What should we be looking for? What controls it? What would be indicators of that? So this is where we're starting to work now. We want to understand essentially what is that, that mess of bugs and, and thiosalts over seasonal scales, over input scales, and start figuring out how do we design monitoring tools, what would be indicators, and give proactive strategies. So I only have a couple more slides. I, as I say, I don't want to spend too much time with too many details, but I just want to give you a taste of sort of where you can go with this. And so what's interesting about um, the Glencore site at, at Onaping is that it's quite a complicated system. So there's an oxidation reservoir. At the time we were working on it before, it was the tailings pond. Um, it's got two tailings lines coming into it. It's got uh, waste coming in from two adjacent mines, a variety of inputs. So as a geochemist looking at something in the field, it's perfect because I've got a wide range of conditions. I can look at this over seasonal um, conditions as well to try and understand the full complexity and dynamic changes that could occur. This is also a system, I should say, that they have really no thiosalts issues in this pond. They've really sort of shown a real increase in their water quality. Um, so it's, it's interesting, we're comparing that to some of our other um, samples where there may be some potential thiosalt issues. So the way we do things, um, similar to Elizabeth's dirt in a bottle, is that we almost always start in the field. You cannot, I would be the first one to tell you, you cannot model an oxidation reservoir using a bucket. It will not work. So you have to have that full scale of the system. So we always start with field characterization. We're doing a lot of enrichments and looking at experimentally what happens with bugs under certain geochemical conditions. We can track things. This is how you start identifying those processes that would feed beautifully into Elizabeth's model of now we can engineer it. So we iterate this, but we're really in the real world, thinking about what's really going on out there. And just very, very quickly, I just wanted to sort of show you we're also spending a lot of time working in this, right, which is understanding thiosalts means we also need to have a much better handle on our sulfur mass balance. 
We need to understand essentially what our thiosalt species are, so we're doing a lot of speciation on that. But this is just to sort of show you a couple of, we have many samples that we're just running through right now trying to get the metagenomics done. But just to sort of show you from the oxidation reservoir, September and November, so we went from late summer to basically early winter, pretty similar total sulfur, but quite a difference in sulfate. So we know mass balance that we have a, a larger concentration of thiosalts in our November sample, still circumneutral pHs, right? Not net acid generating. Using metagenomics, which again, Right? So who is there? IDs. But incidentally, I would also say as a geochemist, one of the things to keep in mind about IDs is that right now it's estimated that less than 50% of the phyla in that tree of life have a cultured member, So meaning we know how they make their living. So just identifying a bug, giving it a name, doesn't mean that I know what it's going to do. This is where metagenomics is so powerful because it's almost like we can take the names, but we can also look at what is it they are doing? Because we can look at not just the genes of heredity, sort of who are they, but how do they make their living? So genes for sulfur oxidation, genes for iron and nitrogen. So we can start binning this and linking names to what they do. We can also look essentially at how they are doing it. Very, very powerful. And this, because I think you should see this, right? So you can come out and say you've seen some metagenomic data. Um, you've seen two sort of iterations of this. So this is work we're doing in conjunction with Jill Banfield's group down at Berkeley. Um, this is, uh, for anybody who's interested, this is Illumina shotgun sequencing, which just means we're taking all the DNA, exactly as Elizabeth said. So we take samples from our tailings pond. We filter some of them. We don't filter others. We take all the DNA. We characterize it. Most of the organisms we find are streamlined. They're bacterial. We don't see very many eukaryotes. We don't see many archaea. So very streamlined communities in these waters, which makes sense. They need to be adapted to the conditions. But we see nuances in the community structure from those two sampling periods. Interestingly, when we look at their genes, what can they do? All of these metabolisms are present at both times. Right? So you're like, hold on a second. You saw some differences in your thiosalt concentrations. What's very interesting is that we have a shift in who's doing those metabolisms from time. And this has a lot to do with temperature. We know that temperature is a huge control on which bacteria you're going to have present in your system. So we often see this summer to winter. These guys are not as effective as oxidizing these thiosalts as these guys are. And a lot of times in mining waters, you often see that summer, late summer situation where you start to see acid generation. We know that we have sort of ecological controls and well-adapted communities that are present often in the, in the summer that are not so present in the winter. These are very simple kinds of things that we can start to back out very quickly. And the idea of this is if we go back to this thiosalts black box, which is a huge issue across the world for mining companies, is that we can start to think about understanding this now, higher resolution geochemistry, but also trying to link in this bacterial presence. We can look for geochemical indicators, but we can also look for microbial indicators. And from that, we start to be able to identify what should you be monitoring for, when should you monitor for, and how do you essentially build into that thinking about maybe managing your systems in a different way. There are many questions. Um, as Elizabeth has mentioned there, I think that the opportunity to innovate and just sort of increase um, the efficiencies and the sustainability of what you do. I've listed a few here sort of on the environmental side, but I think that we're increasingly hearing more on the exploration side about are there opportunities to start thinking about using metagenomics to really give us a better sort of strategy for this. And so, the last thing I sort of want to mention, because I'm looking at Helen from OGI as I'm talking to you guys about this, is one of the reasons that we're here, I think, is also just to point out that there is a Genome Canada call right now for large-scale projects in the mining sector. And so they're looking for industry problems, and they're looking for industry partners to essentially bring in metagenomics. My comment would be it's a very low risk opportunity for you guys to actually see whether or not bacteria could be something useful because you can match Genome Canada money with in-kind contributions. So if you have a, a question or a problem or a challenge where you're interested in saying we might want to start investigating bacterial roles, the Genome Canada call I think would be a really useful one to um, look at. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions um, as I'm sure Elizabeth would and thank you very much for listening.